Hi, my name is Cliff, and I apologize, I injured myself, I can't do it back today. <laughs> so, everything that I'm working on is something that each and every single one of you guys can work on. Um, and it doesn't take that long to wrap up. The reason I was able to wrap up quickly is before I built Speechify, I built like 30 other things. And so that allowed me to build a really solid philosophical framework for how to make decisions, where to find resources, um, and how to navigate life. Um, and it helped me increase, to a very high degree, my adversity quotient. So uh, everybody's familiar with IQ, which is intelligence qu quotient. A lot of people are familiar with EQ, which is emotional intellig intelligence. But something many people are not familiar with is adversity quotient. And that is the way in which you respond when you are faced with an obstacle. Um, and especially in entrepreneurship, but in life in general, how good you are at facing an obstacle is the number one most important thing for whether you succeed or not. Um, you want the intelligence, you want the emotional side, you want everything else, um, but if you talk to most investors, most entrepreneurs, the thing that you want in a founder or in a co-founder is someone who is relentlessly resourceful, who can figure out a solution even when you don't have resources and will not stop until they get it done. And so, like everything in life, the way in which to increase your grit and perseverance and adversity quotient is to practice. But it's not clear how to practice that. So that's what I'm going to focus on talking on today. Um, before I go deeper, um, last time I came to Speaker Brown, the main two goals that I had was to make it clear to everybody that anything that you want to achieve, you can, and anything you want to learn, you can. Um, and to do that, I gave an example of each project that I worked on and how I recruited resources for that. I'm not going to go into that as deeply this time, so I'm gonna put the link to that in the event description um, or post it in the event. So I'm gonna focus on the grid side. So that's section number one. Section number two, I'm gonna focus on the philosophical frameworks and personal principles I built that allowed me to become more efficient at doing things. Okay, so how to practice grit. Um, there's a book that I really like called The Four Hour Workweek. And one of the things that I picked up from this book is this idea of comfort challenges. So before coming to Brown, I knew I didn't want to drink. And so I wanted to make sure that I was really good at not having any social inhibition in social situations. So I did all the comfort challenges from this book. And this is stuff like go to a Starbucks and lie down on the floor. Just for 15 seconds. Just chill on the floor and see if anybody like does anything. And so there's a lot of like, yeah, it's, it's an awkward situation. So, if you do that, you get good at like not caring what people think. And another one is like, go to a mall and talk to everybody from the opposite sex and ask them for the number. Um, another one is just like stare down people when you're looking, like walking down the street, especially people who are bigger than you. Um, and then I iterated on that. I decided, okay, instead of staring down people, I'm gonna lock eyes with someone and smile in their direction and see if they'll smile back at me. Um, and pro tip, that's like one of the most effective things for making your life more happy because you are constantly smiling, and people are constantly smiling at you. So, that's one way, is you take a predefined set of challenges, they're like, um, if you think about it in video game terms, a lot of people like spend their time playing video games, leveling up, etc. These are like the practice challenges. But let's find like the real difficult thing, like the, 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 the boss at the end, um, or the quests that you have to go to. So how do you find quests to increase your grit? Well, the trick is, whenever you have a hard situation that appears in life, view it as an opportunity to improve your adversity quotient. Um, and the non-obvious thing about this is what you want to do is the second something really difficult appears, you have the option of like either trying to solve it or not. Um, decide to go full in, full commitment, to the point where the effort that you put into getting it done is often going to be higher than the reward you get as a result of doing this. Um, so I'm gonna give a couple of like specific stories that are examples in my life where I was faced with a challenge and I decided I'm just going to make it happen regardless of what, like how much resources it took for me, regardless of what the uh, reward was. So the random assortment of stories that I picked was one, the day somebody stole my laptop and how I spent seven hours trying to track it down. Um, two, um, when Nate, who is somewhere in the audience, um, and I had to reschedule a uh, flight for United and I decided I'm not paying the $250 fee. Um, one is how I stayed on meal plan at Brown even after I graduated as a not student. Um, and four is um, Valentin and I just came back from Hawaii and we saw this amazing waterfall that had no path, nobody kn knew how to get there, um, and somebody threatened to shoot us if we went there, but we went there anyway. Um, and there's a bunch of other stories like this, including how I got green cards for some of our team members and how um, like we got a lot of press, but those are the four stories that I'm gonna start off with. Um, 
So the first story is how I got my laptop back when somebody stole it. So I, when I was a freshman, left my backpack um, near the room that has the piano and fonts. And I forgot my sweatshirt inside of the room, so I went inside to get it. And then I came back out and my backpack was gone. And I was like, like I must have left it somewhere. Um, and I realized later that somebody indeed stole my backpack. And so I called the police. Uh, DPS were not very helpful. They were like, okay, we'll take your report. We'll let you know if anything happens. And I'm like, it doesn't really help me. Uh, so I asked, who, uh, there's a security camera. Who has access to the security cameras? And they're like, only detectives have access to the security cameras, but they're, they, they can't talk to you. And I was like, can you give me like their phone number or email? So they gave me their phone number and email. I call, I email, no response. So I went down to the police station and asked to talk to a detective. He told me I can't talk to a detective. So I sat and camped out in the lobby of the police department for the next four hours trying to talk to a detective and made friends with the guy behind the glass. And finally he's like, okay, like I see him going in the bathroom, like I'll sneak you in if you go talk to him. And I was like, great. So I talked to the detective and I was like, hey, somebody stole my laptop. Can I please look at the security footage? And he's like, no, you can't. Even Providence police can't for nine days. And I was like, fine. Can you look at the security footage and tell me what you see? He's like, okay, fine. So he goes in his car to go to the, to the room, and I go in the car with him, and we drive to the place of Brown that has all the security footage. He's like, you can't come in the room, you can't see any of the footage. I'm like, fine. So we go to the building, and I just enter the room anyway, and at that point he didn't stop me. And then we go on the computer, and we're sitting there together, and slyly I pull out my phone and start taking a video of the screen. And so I actually have on my phone the video that we found of the guy coming by, seeing my backpack, coming back, picking up the bag and running away. And I was like, holy cow, somebody actually stole my backpack. Um, so just most people would have stopped at DPS told me stop. And then they would have stopped at they said only detectives have access and the detective didn't pick up the phone. The person at the place told me I can't have it. Most people would have stopped there. This is like seven no's in. Um, so now I know the picture of this guy. And so we're driving back to the station. He's like, wow, we know what this guy looks like. Um, go back to your dorm, live your life normally, we'll let you know if we find anything. And I was like, but wait, let me put find my iPhone on your phone, so in case the guy opens my uh, laptop, it'll connect. And he's like, great, we have it, all right, we'll let you know. And, I was like, and then I refused to leave. I like, basically then grilled him on the history of crime at Brown. How often this happens? Where does this happen? Um, and turns out, like, how often does he get it back? They never get it back. Um, I'm like, great. Um, so I started to think, okay, if I was this guy, what would I do? And I asked the detective questions because he has more experience than I do. Um, one of my principles is the more information you have, the better your decision making is. And he has more information, so I'm going to ask the right questions. Um, turns out that a lot of the times when they go to Apple Store, so I thought if I was this guy, I would go to an Apple Store and try to reset the password. And he's like, yeah, Apple never helps us. They tell us we're not in the security business. And I'm like, well, I'm good at talking to people. I'll go, I'll be nice, I'll camp out for five hours, they'll let me see the security footage. Um, can you drive me to the Apple store? This is before there was Uber at, 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 in Providence. And he was like, fine. So he drove me to the mall, and then he drove back to Brown. So I'm walking in, um, and I know this guy who stole my laptop has a uh, blue cap and a gray vest, and wears blue jeans, is about like six foot something white guy. Has a black uh, backpack. And I'm walking through, and as I'm walking to the Apple store, kind of near the Apple store, I see this guy sitting in the corner, charging a cell phone with a blue back cap and a gray thing and uh, blue jeans, I'm like, holy shit, that's the guy. And so I, I turn around, I go to the security guard, and I'm like, hey, that guy stole my laptop. Uh, and he's like, do you have evidence of this? I'm like, hell yeah, I have evidence of this. <laughs> um, and so I pull out my phone, and at this point my phone is dead, because I've texted all of Brown a photo of this guy being like, if you see this guy, let me know. Um, and he's like, sorry, can't help you. And so I walked up to the guy myself, and I was like, hey, my friends told me you found my laptop. I could not be more grateful. I wanted to give you a reward and say thank you. And he's like, I don't have your laptop, kid. He like, stands up. I'm like, no, you don't understand. My friends told me you found my laptop. I just wanted to come and, and, and give you a reward and say thank you. Like, I don't have your laptop, kid. Leave me alone. Turns around, exits the mall, sprints out of the mall. So I start walking after him. I exit. The security guard is there. And now we're both like going after the guy. He takes three steps. The security guard turns around and goes back to the mall. So now I'm running after this guy myself. And we're running towards the train station. And I'm like, I know you have my laptop! <laughs> Take it out now and put it on the ground! He's like, I don't have your laptop! Like, I know you have my laptop! Take it out now and put it on the ground! He's like, I don't have your laptop! And the other important thing that I forgot to mention, but is the point of the story, is earlier in the day, like six hours before this, I was sitting on the steps of the ratty, and I had this decision to make. I either give up on finding my laptop and I buy a new one, which I was like, not really an option. I'd need to like, go work at the radio much more and take loans, etc. So I didn't want to do. Or 
I dedicate the rest of my life to finding this laptop, and no matter what happens, like I'm getting this thing back. Um, and so that's what I decided to do. Um, and that was a conscious decision. Because um, normal people don't spend eight hours hunting down laptops. Um, and so I canceled all my meetings for the rest of the day, didn't go to any of my classes, and all I did was chase down this guy, and I was not gonna stop until I got the laptop back. Take out my laptop and put it on the ground! So he turns around at this point, like his face is like sheet white. Now, I am bigger now than I was freshman year. So, like, I was not like at all intimidating. Um, I know you have my laptop, you have two options. Take it out now, and put it on the ground, and I will not follow you, police will not follow you, or I will follow you till the ends of the earth until you put it down. <laughs> so the guy opens his bag, takes out my laptop, puts it on the ground. Like, clutched to my chest, like, hug it, kiss the laptop. And he's like, okay, need it, leave me alone, kid. Now, he didn't steal just my backpack, he, like, he stole my entire backpack. Take out my charger and put it on the ground! <laughs> <laughs> he takes out my charger and puts it on the ground. At this point, we got to like a sketchy part of Providence and I was not gonna chase him, so I, where, where do you put the rest of my stuff? In the second story, bathroom of the mall in the trash can. Cool. Went to the second story, bathroom of the mall, found my notebooks and everything else. Called the detectives like, hey man, you pick me up, I got my laptop back. <laughs> At a certain point in the story, I knew there was like a 3% chance that if I went to the mall, I would get the laptop back. But I knew that there was a 97% chance I would not get it back. My logic was if it was not, uh, not at the mall, I would go to the next Apple store in Rhode Island, and then I would start going to Apple stores in Boston. No one takes a risk like this if they're doing it when calculating the value of the laptop uh, versus the value of their time. But in my head, it's fun to take on the world in this way. People who play video games train getting good at hand-eye coordination. People who play basketball get good at like passing a defender. People who lift weights like build their muscles. It is important to build your grit as well. Um, and so this is one of the most effective ways of doing this, and this is one example of a relatively extreme story. But there's many more examples like this. The next example is I decided that I was not going to take a job after school and that I was 100% going to start a startup. And there were many reasons why I decided this, but I decided it, and I was not going to be swayed, and I was going to make it happen regardless, even though I had like a lot of money in loans. Um, and so I was like, great, I gotta solve the problem. So I stayed up till three in the morning, like every day of the summer applying to like 100 scholarships and got enough money to cover most of my loans. And then I found a job that paid me enough money just over the summer um, so I could pay for like basic food and rent in Providence, Rhode Island, which is much cheaper than San Francisco for like the rest 10 months of the year. So I had this infinite runway where I could like work during the summer, like subside on nothing for the rest of the year until I figure out what I wanted to do. The only problem was I wanted to be part of the Brown community and I wanted to be part of the meal plan because I love the ratty. Um, I know you guys, the ratty is the best, you don't know what you're missing. Um, and so I went to try and get on meal plan without being a student and they told me no like nine times. And this was like no from different people. And I was like, no problem, I'm just gonna continue escalating this until I get a yes. Um, so I started as the person at the front desk and then I went to her boss and, I was, and like my plan was like, if this doesn't work, I'm going to Paxson, um, like I'm just gonna keep going. And finally, and I tried a bunch of different things, and finally I got it to work. Um, greatly this was because I wrote a very um, empathetic email based on principles for how to make friends and influence people by Dale Carnegie. Um, that put myself in the shoes of the person I was communicating with, and she said yes. Um, so this is another story. Another great story is the fact that I have not paid the like, fee to transfer flights for like the past four years um, for any airline. Um, and the reason was one day I decided that I was not going to pay that fee because it was not fair and I was going to stay on the phone until I figured it out. And so I got on the phone and I was like, hey, there's this fee, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I just like escalated customer service people until I got to like the person who had the authority to make the decision and I got it to pass. Now that first time I was on the phone, it was maybe like an hour and a half. Um, but then I learned all the tricks of the trade. So I learned that what you do is you call them and you're like, hi. Um, yes, I, I um, can I please speak to your supervisor? Because I know that only like three levels up is the supervisor that can say yes. So I skip the first person, I skip the second person. Um, and then I ask the question like, under what criteria can you waive this fee? Um, again, find additional information so you can make decisions better. And so they'll have a rubric, and so they'll read out the rubric to you. And if they refuse to read the rubric, just go silent. 
because people are super uncomfortable with silence. And so they want to fill the silence, and so they'll tell you the rubric. Um, and if not, start guessing until they start approving. And so the, the trick that I found um, the, the most recent time I did it was um, it's like medical emergency or death or um, what's the one that, that I used? It was extenuating circumstance. So initially I went for medical emergency um, because there was a medical emergency involved, but it turned out that they would charge me the fee and only after a hospital like put in a form they would give me back the money. It's like, I, never mind, it's not a medical emergency, it's an extenuating <laughs> circumstance. Um, and the woman on the line said no legitimately nine times. I recorded this call this time. Um, <laughs> But finally, it became clear that I was not going to get off the phone until she agreed. And so finally, she agreed, and I got the, fee, the thing waived. So now I'm down to like 14 minutes every time I call to get the fee waived. Um, so the really important thing is, though the very first time you decide, I'm doing this ridiculous thing, and no matter what happens, I'm going to continue, the amount of energy it will take will be higher than the reward. You'll learn all the tricks, and the next time it's faster. So my laptop was stolen once. But then my sister's phone was stolen, and then my phone was stolen, and then my brother's phone was stolen. stolen. Every single one of those cases, I got them back. And it took me way less time, and I did most of it on the phone. Um, and it's just because I learned the principles that I needed from the very first time I did it. Um, <coughs> waterfalls are just a fun story. So um, Valentin and I were just in Hawaii. We saw the most amazing waterfall from a distance, and we started asking people how to get there, and we started Googling online, and there was no way of getting to this waterfall. And we were like, fine, we're just gonna do it. Um, and so we drove as far as we could. There was like a sign that said trespassing, we like passed the sign anyway. Um, we like literally rode through some like, rivers, like people threatened us to leave. Um, and so we went back a little bit and parked like somewhere legit, and we we're like, well, we don't see a real path, but a waterfall is the beginning of a river, and we see a river here. We're just gonna walk up this river until we reach the waterfall. And we had no idea how far it would go, or if there was a path. So we started walking up the river. Like two miles in, um, hiking in this river, like there's no even place to walk, so we started swimming up this river. Um, and like lifting our like bags above our heads. Um, and then it started getting dark. And so we're like, oh no, like we don't wanna walk in this river in like the dark. So now we're on a time crunch. Uh, we kept doing it, and there were other people on this road who were also looking for the waterfall in the beginning. <coughs> and they, they went like, to another path. Um, and we were like, we were curious to see if these people will actually reach the waterfall or not. Um, and so one thing that Valentina and I have in common is we both have a very high adversity quotient. And so we were like, especially when there's two of us, we're sure that we'll make it. And finally, indeed, we reached this waterfall, and it was the coolest thing that we did in Hawaii. Um, and then it got dark, like immediately as we were starting to walk back, so we did the rest of the walk with like our iPhones shining light for us. Um, next time we go to this waterfall, it'll be easier for us. Next time we try to find any waterfall, it will be easier for us, because we put in the time the first time. Um, it'll also be easier for us to hunt down a laptop, or like sneak into a conference, or anything else, because we take this opportunity, every single time there is something really difficult, as an exercise for building grids. The way in which I look at obstacles, again, I, I, so I, I teach parkour. Um, and so when you do parkour, you start to view life a little bit differently. As opposed to there's a wall in front of me and so I have to walk around the wall, like I see it as totally normal to run up the wall, grab it, and then like run along the roof. Um, so you start to build this mental model of there's so many options and you might not consider them the first time, but if you really put yourself in an extreme situation, you have to. Um, and so there's, the way I look at obstacles is, right, if there's a door and I can't climb the door and I can't go around, fine, I'll break through the door. So I'll take a running start and I'll just try to get through the door. And the first time I'll crumple to the floor, which is what happened when I started to try to learn computer science. I'm dyslexic, I misspell everything, all the variables break and it sucks. <laughs> um, and so the way I look at like coding is I just like run up, find a wall, crash into the wall, like crumple and then like heal myself and go do it again and again and again until the wall falls. And so you take another running start and you do it again. And as you practice grit, you get better at running, you get better at slamming into doors, but you also figure out how to like lock pick doors. Um, I can lock pick doors because I've needed to in the past because I decided I was going to go to SVG when I didn't have a ticket and that was the only way of doing it. Um, <coughs> so the final point on this topic is uh, the idea from Tim Urban of GTA Life. So, in GTA the game, you can do whatever you want and there's no consequences. But your life 
there's very little consequences as well. <coughs> like, yeah, don't do anything that puts you in jail, and don't do anything that kills you. Um, I recently got injured, but I've done parkour for like eight years without ever sustaining something that has like actually like caused me to go to the hospital. Um, I just pulled muscle. Um, so when, uh, so live your life in a way where a you take on challenges and you just go for it for the sake of having fun. So learn to make grit fun and then use it as an exercise to get better at it in general. Um, when I was a senior, all my friends were getting jobs at Google and Apple and Palantir and Goldman Sachs and Bain. And I was like, wow, these people are getting paid a lot of money. And I need money because I have loans. But I really want to do this startup thing. And I don't even know what startup I want to work on. And at a certain point, I found myself starting to apply to jobs. And it was because I was very afraid of having a situation where I'd have like a financial crunch. Um, and, but then I thought about it realistically. And I realized, well, there's never going to be a point where I'm homeless because I can always go back and live with my parents. And even if I can't live with my parents, I have friends whose parents will take me in. Um, and I've like taught myself enough computer science where I can like get a decent salary if I needed to. Why take a shortcut to this like situation where I have to like do a job? Let's fully try this startup thing. And if it fails after two years, I can still continue. Three years, I can still continue. Four years, and then really if it fully fails, then I'll have to go this other thing. I, uh, we ha I have this friend, uh, Matthew McAteer, who's very good at this as well. And so when he graduated from Brown, he lived in a closet in Cambridge um, and ate lentils for like 150 bucks a month and like cut costs, worked a normal job and just worked in a startup like after work. Um, and so you start doing unreasonable things when you build up a lot of grit and it allows you to achieve things that otherwise you wouldn't succeed in achieving. Um, okay, that's like a general thing about grit and how to use real life circumstances to build it up. Um, I'm gonna move to like mental models about life um, and the things that really have positively impacted me. So the number one thing that I would say has been essential for my personal growth is reading. Read, 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 read. I learned way more from books than I have from school, um, both college and undergrad and everything else, and uh, high school and everything else. Um, I'm dyslexic, so it's hard for me to like, read, read, so I listen to audiobooks. I listen to about 100 audiobooks a year, and I do it by waking up, I put in my earphones, I brush my teeth, I make breakfast, um, I take my earphones out when I'm sitting with my team, and then if I like walk to the bathroom, I listen again, and if I go to the gym, I listen again. You, in total, have like two to three hours every day where you're doing stuff where you can listen at the same time. Um, and listening is super fun, and you learn so much. There was a flight I took once, um, and I listened to a book by Obama, narrated by Obama, and it was an eight-hour book. Most books are about eight hours, but I listened at double speed. By the way, it's super easy to train yourself to listen faster. You just need to push yourself a little bit every single time, and everyone can do it. So I listened at double speed. So four-hour flight, four-hour book by Obama. Essentially, I had a four-hour conversation with Obama. Um, except for every, every minute of the conversation, he spent an hour trying to figure out what he was going to say. Um, and so that's like really valuable learning. But I don't only do this with Obama, I can also do it with George Washington and Alexander Hamilton and Benjamin Franklin and Tesla and all these people um, where they take the most important stuff in their life and they put it in the book. So you can't afford not to read. Um, and if you have challenge reading because you get distracted or you're a slow reader, apply grit and find a way around it. By the way, the reason Speechify came to be is because it was really difficult for me to read, so I built a system that allowed my computer to read everything out to me, and then I improved it over time, and now a lot of other people use it. Oh, if you need to go, by the way, feel free to. Another super important principle is be ruthless with your time. Um, if you like sit down at a lecture and the guy who's speaking is like not a great speaker, don't waste your time. You can't afford to waste your time. Politely leave. Same thing if you're like sitting to like shop a class. If after seven minutes you realize the professor is not very good, leave. Um, on like picking classes at Brown, one of my rules was if there was ever a class where I kept being tempted to look at Facebook, it's not worth it for me to take the class because I can learn this stuff online. Um, you want to find the professors that are the best professors that are really good speakers um, and that are interesting and have good curriculum because otherwise it's not fair to you. Um, so read is number one. Number two, most important principle is build your own table of values. So this idea comes from both Nietzsche and Aristotle, but also more modern people like Ray Dalio. Um, you gotta have a table of values, and each value there needs to be assessed by you. So don't accept values from society or religion or the pulpit or your friends. Create your own values, and you can mimic other people's values, but judge them before you put them in your table. Um, that allows you to have a much more rational view of the world, but also your own personal view of the world that allows you to be much more 
um, aligned with yourself. And so when I was doing this thinking around, do I do a startup or do I take a job? The reason why I was able to make the more courageous choice was because I had this table of values and basic principles that I could just fall back on, and I knew that they were true because I developed them over time from reading and experiences in classes, et cetera. Um, and so the courage there was not actually courage to like, take a risk and do a startup. It was the courage to follow my own principles and like, stick to the idea that it was true that I would not die and I would not be thrown in prison if I ran out of money doing my startup. I could always go back and live with my parents. Um, and that's a very scary thing to do. Um, but it's really important to do because once you overcome that fear and once you get that courage to follow your own convictions, um, you'll end up in a much better situation in life and you'll unlock so much more of life. Now, that being said, to have that conviction behind your decision making, you have to make really good decisions, which is why you want to get as much information as you can every single time and why you want to practice decision making and the best way to do that is A, read a lot, B, do difficult things. Um, learn to code because if you want to be... Uh, this is entrepreneurship talk. If you want to be a founder in 2018, you have to know how to code. You don't need to be great at coding, but be able to build your own MVPs and manage other developers. Um, even if it's really hard for you to code and you misspell all the variables, you can learn. I highly recommend online video tutorials on Udemy by Rob Percival. Um, the number one tip I have for productivity is keep yourself healthy. So sleep eight hours a night. Fitbit costs like 60 bucks and it'll measure your sleep very well. And so. I am a fan of, again, having a lot of information, so what gets measured gets managed. Same thing for like going to the gym and eating well, like it's the best. Um, for more productivity tips, I have a, like entire post about it that has a lot of keyboard shortcuts and stuff that's useful. Um, how are we doing on time? We are almost at Q&A. Almost at Q&A, okay, so I'm gonna breeze through and skip a lot of these. Um, I talked a little bit about being ruthless about your time. Be ruthless about your time. So if you're in a club or a party and it's not fun, get out of there and listen to an audiobook or do what makes you happy. Um, so I know that I really love listening to books. I really love working on projects and building things. I really love intellectual conversations with people. Um, but I don't get that much set. But like, drinking doesn't excite me, so I just don't drink. Um, and like, I refuse to take any class that was not actually actively engaging. Um, to the point where I made my own major and it took me three years to get it approved because there was one class that I thought was useless and I was not going to take it unless, like, because it was not engaging. Um, on the topic of classes, uh, I wrote in the post that I would say the classes that were most useful to me at Brown. Um, like being like a year out of Brown, uh, I keep falling back to the classes that taught me philosophy and thinking have been the ones that have been the most useful in a big range. At the same time, classes that taught me specific skills were really important. So the class that taught me specific skills that were incredibly useful was CS32 Software Engineering, which was a class I was not going to take because it was going to be really difficult, and Valentin convinced me to take it. Again, do difficult stuff. Um, I don't think I could have built Speechify as easily if I didn't take that class. Design classes at RISD are super good. Um, data science is a really good class. Machine learning. Design Studio teaches you how to do like 3D printing, which is a like great, great skill. Um, and then the classes that were better for me on the philosophical side was anything by, with Mark Blythe. So uh, Money and Power, Classics of Political Economy, The Meaning of Life with Charles Larmer is phenomenal. Um, and then there's a couple of other engineering classes that, that I recommend. The other class I would say is Biotechnology and Medicine. Um, is like a survey course that teaches you, like goes through like 10 different technologies and reviews them really fast at a really low level, but it gives you a really good base. Um, the last topic that I'll talk about is don't talk, do. So there's a couple of people who have joined Speechify over time um, who have made the company so much better and have grown as a result. And it's because they saw something that they were excited about, which is working on what oh, we happen to be working on. Um, and a lot of people reach out and talk to me about what we're doing, um, but many of them like talk. Um, there's one guy that I work with, Simon, who I always like to share a story. So Simon reached out to me. Uh, he lives in Bulgaria. And he's like, what you're doing is really cool. So I submitted it to a bunch of reporters to have them write about it. And I was like, oh, that's very nice of you. Um, and then I posted that I was doing an update to my website and if anybody was interested in helping. And so he's like, I'd love to help. And I was like, great. So I sent him a design and he like implemented the redesign to our website. And he's like, is this good? What else can I do? And I was like, well, here's another design. And he's like, what else can I do? And I was like, well, we want to build a Chrome extension. He's like, well, I don't know how to make Chrome extensions, but let me learn. A week later, he taught himself how to build Chrome extensions and now he had one. Um, and he just kept on helping. And finally, I was like, I need to work with this guy. And so I called him up and I was like, hey, Simon, would you like to move to San Francisco? 
um, and work with us. And he was like, yes. And so I got him a visa, got him an apartment, and now he works at Speechify and like leads a big portion of our team. He's going to get a green card in the next year. Um, um, at a certain point, he was like, you know what, I feel like I could contribute more by doing iOS. So he took two weeks, learned iOS, and now he contributes a ton on that part of the program. Um, and then I was doing a lot of customer support, and he saw me do a lot of customer support. So he started doing the customer support. Now, he's from Bulgaria, he does not speak native English. But what he would do is read all the responses that I would make for people, um, and then he mimicked the way in which I did it. Um, and I'm really relatively good at doing emails because I do all of this like trying to weasel my way into stuff I shouldn't be allowed to do. Um, and recently I've noticed that Simon writes some of the best emails I've ever seen because he just picked up my strategy of doing email. And a lot of this is because Simon just gets excited about something and goes and does it as opposed to just talking about it. Um, another great example is Sam who's standing behind the camera right now. Um, when we started to work on Speechify, um, I reached out to Sam and I was like, yo, do you want to help us with this video? And he was like, sure. And like we didn't arrange anything, we just went and made a video. And then we worked on it for three days and it came out really good. And then we ended up working together more and more. Um, so if you find a project that you're excited about, just contact whoever's working on it and start contributing and it'll develop from there. Um, as a quick recap of the most important stuff, um, number one, reading is the most important thing. Read, you can't afford not to. Um, view life critically and be confident and courageous in sticking to your own values um, and do that by gathering as much information as possible so you can make better decisions. Um, view life as an opportunity, like hard things in life as opportunities to practice grit. Um, so don't only think of it as the amount of energy I put versus the reward that I get. Think of it as the amount of energy that I put plus the reward that I get plus the most important thing, the learning of doing that. Especially when you're young, it's really worthwhile to build this muscle. And that's really it. Hit me with questions.